You are listening to the Enlightenment Evolution Network. Welcome to Earth Sky People Radio. Living in harmony with Mother Earth and awakening to an intergalactic society. With your host, Victoria Vives, founder of Reiki Wellbeing and co-founder of the Earth Sky People Movement. Hello, this is Air Sky People Radio with your host, Victoria Vives. You can find me at victoriavives.com and today is Tuesday, September 9th, 2014. And I would like to take a moment to tune in with you. So if you are not driving, close your eyes for a moment and imagine that we are holding hands in a circle all around the world connecting with one another and connecting with our Mother Earth. And imagine yourself surrounded by light, light that is bringing love and nourishing to you, to your heart, enhancing our connection, bringing healing and love to this world, transforming our societies, our relationships, and take a deep cleansing breath and you can open your eyes. Okay, and with that awareness of our interconnectedness, I will remind you that we are together here in Earth Sky People Radio. Earth representing our connection with Mother Earth and nature and sky representing spirituality and life beyond the Earth like extraterrestrial life, extra-dimensional life. And our guest last week was Karen Newman. And you can listen to that show in the archives and it was amazing information regarding our course in miracles, Hinduism, Ganesha and oneness. And today it is Earth Time. This is one of our adventure shows and we have a very special guest. His name is Christopher Niargas. And he is the author of several books about wild foods, wilderness living, nature awareness, and ecology. So, welcome, Christopher. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me today. I really enjoy being with you. Thank you so much. It's awesome having you here. Also, I know that you have a, a very good balance between the spiritual world and the, the more down-to-earth practical living. Is that right? Well, I... I've, I've often heard that, uh, you know, it, you need to have about that kind of a balance in life. If, if, if you're uh, totally focused on your physical survival, you have to ask yourself, what am I surviving and what am I surviving for? I mean, do we just want to be thugs who survive as some catastrophe? Uh, I mean, we do want to balance. I, I always tell people it's not just about... Uh, 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 a naked guy in the woods surviving by eating rats because, I mean, oh, yeah, he's surviving, but what relevance does that have to the rest of us, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what a lot of these survival shows miss, well, they have no soul, they have no heart, they're just some uh, some competition, but real life has its men and women, its children, its family, its living life, and, uh, and what is the meaning of life? What are we pursuing? So I often tell people... Uh, those shows on TV, that's not what I teach, and that's, I would turn those off because they have no redeeming value with, with very few exceptions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a balance is very important in your life. You, in fact, I would say that you, you should probably every day ask yourself, what is the meaning of life, and mm -hmm. what is the meaning and purpose of my life, and how are the things that I'm doing today fulfilling that purpose? And uh, I, mean, I, I try to do that when I wake up. With a few exercises, I, I'm not saying I do it every every single day, but I try to do it before I go to sleep. Review mm -hmm. my day. How did I fulfill whatever I have perceived my goals are, and however I have perceived the purpose of us even being here? How have I done that? It, or you know, did I do that? Sometimes we we think we did, and then uh, I had a teacher who used to say, "Well, what are the uh, demonstrable facts? What are the measurable facts? You might." might feel good today, but what did you do? What did you do in the world that that meant something that mattered, right? 
Right. And so that, that's that's the harder part. What was what was demonstrable? Right. And, you know, I feel the same. Um, sometimes maybe I have uh, clients that come for sessions and, you know, I try my best to to help them at uh, setting goals that is not just, oh, I feel great or I want to feel in this way, but really see how are you going to know that you reach that? What, it, what has to happen so that you have something more tangible? And I feel right, exactly. it's what you are saying, that we need something practical that we can um, really relate to and, and we can uh -huh. accomplish. So that's Well, I would, I would say, <laughs> you know, I've, you mentioned that I wrote several books. One of the books was called Extreme Simplicity mm -hmm. that, I, that was published over 10 years ago, and it was what my wife and I did at our home. And what we were trying to point out is that we didn't know everything, mm -hmm. nor did we have an unlimited budget. So we proceeded, we proceeded to live our life by altering the things that were under our control little by little. And that is to say, if you think about what, what is under our control every day, well, we, we allow certain thoughts in our brain, right? We, we make certain choices. But also uh, our diet, that's what we eat affects not just our bodies, but what are we supporting economically, mm -hmm. what part of the economic commerce are we supporting or not supporting right. by the choices we make and the types of food we buy. So we, uh, of course, you, you're aware that I've long, you know, since I was 10 or 11 years old, been interested in wild foods, the foods mm -hmm. that just grow naturally. And I, that always occurred to me that, why don't more people do that? And I know it's getting bigger, <laughs> but, yes. but think about it. It's free. Right. It's, it's, more, it's more nutritious <laughs> than the food that grows in a supermarket, oh my uh, and, and it, it's actually, it tastes good. It so does. there are a lot of people who have come to my classes who thought, well, they were going to just try to taste the stuff that they were certain it was going to be terrible, but it actually tastes good. Yes. And so I've, I've never tried, or I would say just uh, except for short periods of time, I've never tried to just live off of wild foods, but tried to incorporate them daily into my diet as oh. well as uh, the things that I grow. So that's a you know even even if somebody said gosh I want to improve my life what should I do what should I do differently well you know you could look at your food choices obviously mm -hmm. you get get a good nutrition book there's loads of them out there Adele Davis is a good start mm -hmm. uh, uh, diet for a small planet is another good one and you probably have some suggestions but the ways that we interact with the soil in our yard assuming let's say if you live in an apartment you have less more limited but if you have a little backyard. Uh, why do we grow pointless ornamentals in lawns when we could be growing a little bit, just even if it's just a little bit, of what will provide us with food and medicine and fragrance? Right. And then, and then, and then, you know what happens to people's minds? Suddenly, there is no such thing as a weed when you're walking around. I've watched people in my classes, and they're <laughs> and, and 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 they're 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 not stepping on plants because oh, that's tomorrow's lunch. <laughs> right. Because there's food, there's food everywhere. Yes. And so it, it does cause people to be, you know, it's, it's a start, it's a beginning, to become slightly more aware that every everywhere is food and that every choice that we're making can affect not only today but tomorrow. So mm -hmm. it affects the way that you use pesticides or not or the way or whether you use herbicides. Um, I've told people, they said, how do I get rid of such and such in my yard? And I said, well, what is that such and such? Well, it turns out it's a good food. Mm -hmm. So. We need to re-educate ourselves with this in mind, uh, and I, I have um, I, I have kind of chuckled when I've gone to these uh, uh, home home repair shops. I forgot the one I'm thinking of. It's uh, it's a garden supply place. I won't mention the name, but there's a whole long row of herbicides and pesticides for gardening. Oh. And I've always thought, why must we focus on death in order to have life? Wow. Makes no sense. Right. So. There is a there is a chart by one of the chemical companies in full color, and it has I believe the last time I counted I think 64 pictures of plants weeds that grow their sin is that they grow on your lawn, and they have a poison for every one of those they grow on your lawn and you've got to get rid of them quickly. Now one or two of them I think there's poison oak and some other grass but they're all good medicines or food, and yet there's there are whole industries that have been built up to eradicate those plants because they grow on your lawn, a pointless, a pointless holdover from, from who knows what, you know. So, mm. be, you know, we begin by those things that are under our control and dealing with a lawn 
and your diet are two very good ways to start on this path of awareness. Beautiful. And you know, you mentioned yeah. about connecting with, uh, not connecting, but being aware of the plants that we can always see that are sometimes treated as weeds. And my experience is that since I started learning more about the wilderness uh, plants that we can eat, my relationship with nature has completely changed. So when yes. I go uh, for a walk in the mountains, I, well, because of my shamanic path as well, I talk to the plants, I recognize the plants, I taste the plants, and our relationship with our environment totally changes. Whereas if yes. we have things that are just ornamental, as you were saying, uh, first of all, we have many times we have to water them a lot, and we are we have a drought, so it's not the best at this moment. Uh, they don't grow naturally. Sometimes they're competing with the natural plants of the area. So right. I feel that it is a lack of awareness, and I'm so happy that you are doing this to share more about how we can uh, relate to our environment. Right, right. Let me tell you something. In my very first book that I wrote, because my first love was botany, mm -hmm. I, I became fascinated at an early age that there were Native Americans who lived here in Southern California. I know people all over the country might be listening to your show. Probably they could listen all over the world, can't they? Yes. But, but <laughs> I, grew, I grew up here in L.A. County, and uh, I became fascinated with the fact that we had Native Americans who lived here in the pre-Spanish days, and they lived off the land. There was no hardware store. There was no uh, no grocery store. There were no hospitals. Wow. Nature provided everything they needed. Yeah. And, and so in my very first book, A Guide to Wild Foods, I have a little section about the spiritual aspect of each plant. Wow. Now, uh, or, or, you know, the, the lore or the spiritual aspect. Now, I don't have something on every plant because that takes a bit of mental work to find that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I have a little bit of mixed feeling about the increased interest in wild foods today because there, there does appear to be a lot more interest. Part of it is because part of my concern is that when we view the world in strictly physical terms, we think of it more as just more chattel, more stuff to own and to use. And so uh, it bothers me when I see people, they say, oh, look at all the chickweed. I'm going to go out and make a salad and I could sell it and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and they, they're not. They're, it, is a, it is another life form. Right. And it, it totally, when you have that added, it's a certain mindset that, that uh, ma many uh, people in the world, they, they, they maintain towards everything, looking at things in strictly economic and strictly mm -hmm. physical terms. But, you know, what about the spirit world? Right. What about the world? Uh, what about the, the 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 world of spirits that we don't see, that brings into manifestation the plant kingdom? Wow. And I, I I fortunately had teachers, who who kind of forced us to slow down and realize these are living beings. Mm. There's a signature to each of them. That is to say, there's something that tells us what they epitomize symbolically, and and that's what uh, doctrine of signatures was all about where people, they didn't try to just simply look for a shortcut to the medicinal value, but they looked for, what is this plant? What does it symbolize in terms of thought being manifested? Mm. Okay, and, and I think, I think uh, we've lost so much of that that we've delegated it to meaninglessness. But I, I used to give talks on this subject at, um, it's been years now, but at the Philosophical Research Society, and we focused on, you brought up the drought, for example, we focused on all, all problems. Uh, this was an all-day seminar we gave once, and uh, we, we listed all of these problems on the board that people could think of, modern problems. There's a drought, there's homelessness, there's economic problems, and blood, you know, everything you could think of. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the, interesting thing part, the interesting part of it was the lady who ran the program later said, this was the only program we've, well, I can ever remember where everybody participated. Because normally they're just lectures where people listen. But what my wife and I were trying to do was get people to respond in their own thinking that these, okay, what is, here, here's how we did it, just so you get a clue. We're going, we want people to think about, okay, here's the problem, but what, co what caused the problem? That is to say, what is the proximate cause? So you could say a guy's homeless because he has no job. Okay, you could, you could, you could take the immediate uh, cause of right. the problem. Uh, you could say there's a drought because it's not raining. But then we said, well, if, if the material world is a manifestation of thought, 
If our entire material world, and that is to say, my life, the the world that I live in, you know, each of us lives in our own little world because of our previous choices and our ongoing choices. Mm -hmm. If this is all a manifestation of thought, what were those thoughts? What is the thought that leads to drought? uh, It's a collective thought. And so we had a big blackboard, and we wanted people to see what are the previous types of thinking that would lead to each of these problems individually or on a national level. Wow. And, then, and then when you identify that, what do you do about it? Mm-hmm. And, and it, again, it's, very, it's somewhat complex, but it, it, it has to do with changing one's thinking yeah. cha- and then changing your choices and your behavior. But it's mm-hmm. actually very uh, beautiful when you do that because you realize suddenly you have your eyes wide open. There are things, there are, we all have behaviors that should be eliminated. Uh, mm-hmm. although we hold dear to these behaviors sometimes because somehow we're attached to them through tradition. But, um, I mean, just like having a lawn, maybe, as simple mm-hmm. as having a lawn. Mm-hmm. It has, it has no, no meaning whatsoever except it impresses the neighbors. And <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I don't mean to step on people's toes. Some people may find that, you know, the children play on the lawn or something. Mm-hmm. But that's just one example. Uh, I remember uh, a neighbor was telling me how she put up a compost pit in the yard and she put the leaves and things in there and she rented this little this apartment and there were several people there but the landlord just thought that was the most ridiculous oh. well why would you do that you would got i provide a trash can right oh. it's like i provide a trash can what do you need to you know so in other words the landlord it was strictly an economic arrangement as far as he was concerned why would an individual want to take what you know the leaves that fall from the trees and and create and, and participate in life's most fundamental biological function, which is what everybody ought to do. So the yeah. landlord was, was blind. He was spiritually blind. And, and you know, this is, this is what I hope that will happen into the future, that people will realize that we can take all of the resources. Little, you, start, you start with the things that are under your control, mm-hmm. and you start to make wise choices. And, and you, you cre- we, create, we, we create a paradise or we create a hell on earth, depending mm-hmm. on our choices. Right, and I also, mean that, that's really the bottom line. And many times it's just that we are ignorant, and I can I can say that I was ignorant. I had my trash can, and I thought that's what I have to do. But then Me we too. started. Me too. Everybody. Yeah, Me too. We started uh, having a mulch pile, so. For me, it's such a pleasure now to, to throw things there because I feel that I'm not waste, wasting anything, but instead I'm recycling for sure. I'm connecting with Mother Earth. And the things that in the trash are there, just trash in the mulch pile are new life. So exactly. these small things can really change the world. And sometimes just by doing it ourselves, our neighbors maybe get curious and ask us. And that is the way in which we can really change the world and making these kind of shows, the kind of classes that you do, all of this, you know, I, I have so much faith that we are transforming this right now. So <laughs> uh-huh. I'm excited. Well, I mean, that, that, that is where it begins. Like, I know we experienced the elements gathering together. Yeah, and, of course, nice. we're all in the woods and it's beautiful. <laughs> and so uh, I used to do that when I was in my teens. I'd go to the woods a lot because I wanted to be alone. I'd be with a friend and we're up there and we're drinking water from the stream and we're collecting plants and maybe fishing and just relaxing, but we were taking care of our trash. But what I always thought was, okay, now why is it that these same people that I go backpacking with, they come back to the city and they don't make an effort? Mm -hmm. They don't make the same effort that they made when they were backpacking. Again, I know this is changing, Mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I think we have a long way to go still, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We have a long way to go because because we still worship that God called money. Mm -hmm. And, And I know people have said to me, doesn't matter what you say, the bottom line is still the bottom line, meaning money. And, uh, and I am not somebody who believes that money doesn't uh, matter, uh, but I, I do my best to not worship money. That is to say, if there's a principle where something should be done a certain way for mm-hmm. rightness, you, we, sometimes money, you know, you, you can't eat money. You, you can't drink <laughs> money. You can't breathe money. Right. So, so oh, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's, an in, it's an inescapable part of our daily life, and yet we, we should allow it to serve us, not serve it. And yeah. too many of us, uh, we, we serve money for our whole life, and therefore we make bad uh, environmental choices or health choices because we factor the money thing in. Now, I'll give you an example, and not everybody will agree with me, but 
I have a friend who was trying to sell a house. Mm. And he did a lot of things that I don't, I don't think he would ever do otherwise. Like, he just he just wanted to have a, the greenest lawn. And oh. there, were certain, there were certain structural things that he did. And I said, no, wh- why did you actually do that? Why did you? He said, "Well, because the market demands it in order for me to sell my place." I said, "Really? I think I think you could actually appeal to a higher consciousness mm. because there are, there are more and more people who don't want the the, the it's a, a burden to maintain a green lawn if it you is. travel, <laughs> right? So what do you need a green? You know, and so so he did, he does he did, actually didn't sell his house and decided to stay there, so it became a moot point." But mm-hmm. but his thinking is very true. We do things for the marketplace, and then the new owner comes in, and they don't want that anyway, we, we, we discover, right? And that's so why I we, wanna, uh, when, when you mention about money, I feel that it's more about what others think, because I feel that we don't necessarily gain money from doing these things. It's just that it's the standard that most people think is, is good to have, and if you don't follow it, maybe some people look weird at you. So I think it's more about how others look at us than money itself. I think you're right. I think you're right. One of the uh, one of the most uh, heated lectures that I ever gave was about I gave a series of lectures some years ago about money. What is money? How does it work? You know, how does it uh, how does this international money work? But when I got to the personal part, and this was like about a three hour talk about the illusions of money that we believe in. Hmm. <laughs> oh man, people! People! Everybody was arguing, wow. and I was—I was trying to keep, you know, because people. One guy, because one of the illusions that I call an illusion, and this was it was actually based on an article that somebody wrote in the Coevolution Quarterly called "The Four Illusions of Money." Mm-hmm. I reprinted it in my Extreme Simplicity book, but one of them is I need money for my old age, and one guy said, "Well, I do need money," oh. and he was getting mad. Now, see, my point was that we believe that money is the thing we need. And I know it's a subtle point in our thinking, but the things that we want is we want security, right. you want you, you want you want medical attention if you're hurt. Right. But if, if you identify the things that you need, you mm. often realize there are non monetary ways mm. to achieve them. Yes. People sometimes think they need money for people to respect them, believe it or not. And mm. and uh, there is a type of respect that people with money have, but I would argue that that's not real respect and if if somebody really respected you, it wouldn't matter if you had the money or not. Absolutely. <laughs> but and so you, you know, when the rich man loses money, if it's a phony wow. type of respect, they lose the friends right. too. So the things that you need for old age are the things that the qualities of a person that uh, you know. If you're a loner, you're not going to have you. You know, you want to be a cooperative person. Right. You want to work with other people. You want yeah. to be cheerful to be around. You don't want to always be complaining. You want to be helpful. You know all the good traits that make a good human being yeah. will make you uh, will make you valuable to others in your old age, and that's really what people want. Yeah. We're, we're so focused on building money that we are uh, missing the point that we're trying to build society and culture and families. And uh, the the pre the emphasis on money often divides families and communities, for that matter. Mm, so yeah, so there, it, it, that that it's a big one to um, to deal with in a proper way, you know. Yes, because you know it's like when we disconnect from the earth, we start creating all these kinds of necessities and uh, things that we think are are necessary, like um, what, what we were talking, the food. Well, it has to be bought in the supermarket or the house has to be in this way and that way. And everything starts having a cost and then we have to mm-hmm. work and then we have to have less time for our relationships. Whereas mm-hmm. what I feel is that what we really, really need is our relationships with one another, with the earth, with the elements so that we respect our earth, which is the only thing that gives us life, the only thing that we really need to survive. And creating those relationships and uh, nourishing them, that is so important, but our society, for some reason, is not focused on that. And I feel that it is because of the money issue, but the money that a few have, (laughs) a few that are controlling the system. (laughs) Well, I I recognize that there are a lot of things in the society that I personally can't do anything about, but what I can do about, and when we talk talk about money and needs, I, I, I've asked people in my classes, okay, make a list 
of all the things that you say that you need. Mm. This, this will be somebody may or may not be considered in an economic hardship, but make a list of all the things that you need, and let's go over them. And sometimes they're they're wants. They're not really a true need. And that's okay. Right. And sometimes they're idle. They're they're things that are never good. They're never going to do anyway. They're just writing something down. But if you write a list of all of your needs, and, 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 and these are genuine needs, you're going to find that there are a lot of ways to achieve those goals. And money may make it go quicker, but many times money is irrelevant. And yeah. but because, because, you know, if I wanted to be a quack psychic, Victoria, you know what I'd say? I'd put on my little red hat and I'd go up <laughs> to people and I'd, and I'd say, oh, let me think, let me think, oh, Oh, I know what you're thinking. You could use more money. Am I right? Oh. Of course. So, so you, you know, I'll get 100% right on every. No, it doesn't matter what their economic level is. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got that right on. So, so everybody's going to say they need more money, but when you ask them, what do you need it for? You know, they might say paying bills, but if we're talking uh, to achieve a goal, it's amazing how many people do not write those goals down. It's amazing how many people have not formulated precisely what, what does that mean? Now, we, we know what it means to say, I want to have a college degree, okay? There's various colleges to choose from, various degrees to choose from, and we hope that you've had the foresight to think beyond the degree and how it will enhance your life. But uh, there, are, there are many, many goals for which uh, you can trade labor yeah. or which you can simply uh, proceed with no money at all, like... Yeah. Uh, I mean, by getting a book at the library and studying something or finding somebody who's an expert in learning a skill. Or, you know, like with, with our focus on stuff that you have to buy. I've often told people we're, we're surrounded by so much junk, uh, and you keep buying junk. But if you focused on only quality, you know, if you, if you spent more for the items you bought and bought less, you would never regret it because quality doesn't go out of style rather than trying to save money by buying trinkets and then you throw it away every year. Mm-hmm. So so then there so part of the thought process of changing ourselves is what do we really need? Right. Do I really need to be those trinkets and clutter up the 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 trash piles of the world because I don't I'm tired of it next month. Yeah. And then and then what can I make? So this this is partly what I do in some of my classes and programs is I show people how to make things. Oh, nice. uh, but but I like to focus on useful things, not trinkets. You know, and and so we there was a time when I did a lot of woodworking and I learned how to make things and use a few tools and I'm still no expert at it. But there there are so many th- useful things that we could make right. that we don't have to spend money on. Right, then, I'm with you totally. Like yeah. I love that. My husband always tells me that I'm very resourceful because That's I'm always good. going to have anything that I want and money has not been a strong part in my life. Now I'm more yeah. stable. But I feel right. that if we have imagination, creativity and just connections, relationships, we can really achieve like anything as you are saying for sure. Do you know my mother um when I my mother grew up on a farm And then both my parents lived through the Depression. And uh, my mother was a Cub Scout den mother. Mm. And so when I was growing up and I was very young, there'd be the Cub Scouts in the house once a week with projects. Now, today people go to these stores and they buy all these things that that allows the children to do something. But my mother, had she had stuff going every week and there was like popsicle sticks and cans Uh-huh. And old ice cream tubs. I mean, it was all from recycled stuff. She would make musical instruments. There'd wow. be games that we'd be played. There uh-huh. would be art projects. Uh-huh. No, she she didn't buy anything. That's she, awesome. It was it was all egg cartons. I mean, you know, you name it. She found uh-huh. a way to turn all of the stuff that we throw away uh-huh. in, into little projects. So I learned yes. from an early age that th- this is not trash. This mm-hmm. has uh, uh, all the, multiple possible uses depending on mm-hmm. your imagination and creativity. You know, so to this to, to, to this day, I I I I stand in the woods. We're walking along, and I'll, I'll stop and I'll say, "Hey, does everybody see the water purifier?" I'll say, "Huh? <laughs> somebody somebody dropped the water purifier in the room." So well, what are you talking about? Then there's the beer can. Oh. You take the beer can, you rinse it out. You could boil water in the beer can, nice. and you could make fire from the bottom, and you could cut it open, and you could signal with it. So <laughs> then they say, "Oh, they laugh." You know, then I'll see, I'll see a, a glass beer bottle, and I'll say, "Hey." Does anybody see the water purifier again? It's a solar water purifier. <laughs> and, 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 and so then they say, oh, I, don't, well, I don't see anything. You mean the bottle? 
And so, yeah, you, hey, do you remember uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy, the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy? A bottle fell out of, like a Coke bottle fell out of the sky in some tribal region in some remote tribe. And they all they all got to use the Coke right. bottle for like a bre- like a like rolling out dough mm-hmm. and breaking you know cracking things and they mm-hmm. they found a million uses for a product that was not part of their society. Yeah. And that's the that's the idea. We have so much that we're just jaded and we always want more. So mm-hmm. we really are this society collectively we're our own worst enemy. We are the problem because we think that stuff is going to fulfill a spiritual emptiness. Mm-hmm. But and, and some people just keep buying. They're just a buying frenzy all the time. All the time they got to buy stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I would highly encourage you and your listeners to watch the movie The Book of Eli with Denzel oh, Washington. Oh, we watched it. Nyan and Wasn't I watched it. that amazing? It. Yes, it was amazing. I love uh, it. It's, yeah. it's an excellent story. I mean, for the, everybody who's seen the, the trailers, they know it's about a post-apocalyptic world. But in, in some scene, and so there aren't any big cities anymore. And these the little villages or towns. And in one scene, a young girl says to Denzel Washington, what was it like before, meaning before the nuclear attack or whatever, nuclear exchange? And he says, well, everybody had far more than they needed or so, something mm-hmm. like that. And, and it makes you think about, yeah, we have, mm-hmm. in the United States, uh, I don't care if a person is legally considered poor, we really don't have poverty Absolutely. Such as exists in some of the third world countries. Maybe yeah. on some of the Indian reservations, we've got third world conditions in this country. Mm-hmm. But but every, every you know even the poorest person has so many yeah. government opportunities. If you, if you have a house and you could turn on the water, right, mm-hmm. and, and you have a toilet, right. you're a king. Yes. You are a millionaire con- yeah. compared to world standards. And yeah. and uh, I mean you should just be very thankful that you don't have to just dig a hole in the backyard and, and, and cook over a fire. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I, <laughs> I do that sometimes myself, by choice. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, yes, I totally get, get it. Last night, yeah. we were, Nyan and I were in San Diego, and we did that. We were outdoors. and You were in ma- San Diego last night? Yeah, I was, we were. Oh, great, great. Um, uh, and there is a house there that um, my in-laws have, but we were uh-huh. outside, we made a fire, we put the tent, and <laughs> we, yeah, just, that's great. we just were in that way. Yeah, I really feel that, um, you know, the walls of the houses disconnected me um, from nature so much. But when, yes. I, when I'm outdoors, I'm so in tune with everything that is happening that I miss more of that. <laughs> right, right. I think that many people... Uh, just through lack, just because of the way city life is, hmm. they have become frightened of the outdoors. Oh, it's there's true. bugs out. Yeah. There's bugs yeah. out there. There's <laughs> snakes out there. There's there's burglars and prowlers out there. Oh. So uh, I, I I think it's a uh, it, some people really you you know you do one thing at a time and you realize mm-hmm. that the picture that you had of the world is almost certainly false. Yeah. If your picture of the you know you, one of the things that sometimes we forget is that. The average person has a job. They're in a very insular environment for the day. They might go to the supermarket, then they go home, and they often don't interact as much. Now, there are people, of course, that widely interact with other people, but it, but for many who don't see and meet and don't have a public life, their picture of the world is what they get on the news. Yeah. And and the picture on the news is focusing on those really bad things. Mm-hmm. And although those bad things might be more or less accurate that are being depicted, more or less accurate, it's it's not the world that it li- that, that exists. I mean, I remember there was some shootings somewhere in L.A. Uh, close to where I lived in some freeway shootings, mm-hmm. and I got a few calls from relatives in the eastern U.S. and they said, "Hey, have you gotten shot at? Are you being affected?" And I said. Yeah. What are you talking oh, about? Oh my I mean, there's there's a there's a million people that or many millions that pass at any given point on the freeway any given day in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and I live right. like 15 miles from there. And no, I nothing. My life has gone on uh, quite boringly uh, mm-hmm. since those shootings occurred. I know nothing about it. In other words, the news they hammer these things home, mm-hmm. and you think that's the only thing going on anywhere in the world. Nothing positive, and so mm-hmm. sometimes it's best to maybe get a news summary. But not oh, yes. believe, not believe what they're telling you, because uh, you know that that's part of our mental diet. Right. If we're constantly feeding our mind 
certain ideas and we don't take the time to see the other side where we, we have a distorted view of reality. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you something here. A lot of people have asked me if I'm, uh, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Are you a Libertarian? They want to know what my politics are. I said, guess what? I listen on the radio to K- KPFK and to KRLA. Mm. Extreme opposites. Oh. Because I like the, I, I, in other words, KRLA is the right wing radio. Right. KPFK okay. is the left wing radio. Mm. And they often, they often exhibit uh, both sides, exhibit great intelligence and great ignorance. And I like to pick and choose what, where I think are, are the right postures, but I don't believe, and I, I, think, I think our trouble comes in the world and in life when we cling to an extremity. All of the problems are extremities. When you have a, a group uh, and everybody is essentially the same, you have serious problems in terms of their world outlook and how they mm-hmm. interact with others. When you have a more integrated neighborhood People of different types and backgrounds interact. They're far more tolerant, yeah. and you have a far more meaningful neighborhood yeah. than if you have all one one racial group or one religious group. Uh, and and I think it's it's good and important for people to not, to, you know, to realize that there are many viewpoints that are different from yours. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't yeah. make that doesn't make you right and them wrong or vice versa. But it means they have a different viewpoint. Yeah. Okay, would it hurt you to listen and understand what their viewpoint is and why they have that viewpoint? Mm-hmm. If they have some factual errors, or if you have some factual errors, if you both listen to each other and converse and keep the guns at home, mm-hmm. maybe you both can come to an understanding and become <laughs> friends. Absolutely. No, seriously. You know, we, I mean, we I, really I, need I, that. We really need diversity. It's not possible uh, to really move beyond what we have right now unless we listen to each other and see what it each person can bring to the picture. Right, and, and, and li- actually listen to other people. Yeah. I have had, somebody once said to me, because I teach writing classes too, hmm. and I sometimes teach mm-hmm. people how to share their opinions about things. Somebody said, well, what's the point? Everybody has a formulated opinion and they don't change anyway. I said, really? I don't think that's true. <laughs> to, uh, yeah. A bigot has a formulated opinion and doesn't change it. Yeah. You know, a, a guy who lives in a closet has a formulated opinion and doesn't change it. But I've had my opinion changed on many things. Mm-hmm. I've had my uh, here, here's a here's a down to home example. Uh, there was a period of time when I was married to Dolores. She she passed away in 2008. But when when we would get into an argument, and there was a period of time when I thought, you know, she's wrong and I'm right, but I'll just put up with it for a while. Mm-hmm. I mean that's what I believed. And then I realized, I started to try to listen. Somebody else said to me, you know, she's ro- she's right. You know, somebody else said that. And, and if I started to listen, I realized, well, you know something? She's right and I'm right, but we just have a different point of view. We're just expressing essentially our opinions and our viewpoints. And we'll, But once I realized that it's not all about I'm right and you're wrong, but right. that we have we have slightly differing points of view, we, we got along far better. Hmm. Okay, And that happens on a personal level. Certainly, I mean, you, every country doesn't have to be the same as the United States for us to cooperate and get along. I mean, they can do the, you know, Canada can do their own thing, Mexico yes. can do their own thing. You know, every country can do their own thing as long as, long as uh, you know, I mean, I mean there, are, there are limits, of course. But the, mm-hmm. but the point is, everybody doesn't have to be a carbon copy of me or you in order for us to get along with them. In fact, diversity makes life far more interesting. If everybody was a carbon copy of Christopher, I would, I should probably commit suicide immediately, because that would, that would be a very boring place to live if you think about it, right? <laughs> yes. I'm just joking about that. I, 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 love, that. I, love, <laughs> I love diversity. I totally feel that it's what helps us moving forward for sure beyond what we normally are. So yeah, of I course. totally agree. And you know, I I know that you have been teaching uh, this wilderness skill since 1974. And before that, was that there, there something different, or what was your transition? What brought you to this, to to sharing all of this that you are sharing oh. now? Okay, well, I was born in 1955, and so by the mid 60s, 66, and so hmm. uh, uh, I was 10, 11 years old. My older brother, this was kind of my, you know, you wake up, you you live your world. Uh, uh, and then you start thinking about things. Now, there were no Indian people where I lived, but my older brother was a camp counselor, and he would bring home books about the Indians. Mm-hmm. And at school, in third or fourth grade, Indians were people who lived in teepees and hunted buffalo. Mm-hmm. And then I started, I, I started thinking, well, there are no buffalo around here. 
Right. And so I, I used to go hiking, and I remember one day, it was probably 66 or 7, uh, there was this guy we met, and he started talking about, he, he was not an Indian guy, but he started talking about how he had studied with Indians in Northern California and learned some of the foods that they ate. And I said, really? What do they eat? And he started telling me, and there were things that were around where we were. He mentioned miner's lettuce and, yeah. and pine needles and nice. pine cones. And he mentioned some of the plants that I could still find. And I remember that was kind of like a spark that turned me on. Wow. And uh, then I began, uh, you know, uh, shortly thereafter, I'm entering high school. Mm -hmm. I took botany courses in high school, and I joined the Mycological Association. So you could say that it was my interest in Native American pathways, mm -hmm. and specifically, just it just intrigued me that people didn't go to the store. And, <laughs> and, 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 and in other words, in other words, what does what does everybody tell a child from a young age? Go to school, get your degree, so you can get a job, so you can pay for all the crap that you're going to have oh. to pay for the rest of your life until you die. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no, it, it was a very it's a very cynical view, but I saw so many people going that route who were always bankrupt who were never happy, who died early, I'm thinking, you know, oh, well, the Indians didn't go get a job. They actually just did it directly. The <laughs> idea of providing for yourself, at least somewhat in a modern society, directly, mm -hmm. that highly appealed to me. So mm -hmm. then um, then after, uh, I guess, 19, uh, you know, through high school, I, after high school, I moved to my grandfather's farm for a season. I'd been there during the summers. And so the idea of using plants, I'd already been doing it for several years. 1974 was a year when there, uh, a, a group asked me to start teaching classes. Mm -hmm. So I was involved with, I knew the folks at a nonprofit in Highland Park called WTI, and they wanted to have field trips where people could go out and actually see the plants, wow. see the mushrooms. And mm -hmm. you have to remember, I'm, I'm like just right out of high school, <laughs> but I already, I already knew I knew I knew plenty of plants, but still, by uh, compared to what I know today, it was it's almost laughable. Mm -hmm. But p the people who came on the walk, the very first walk was in the one of the local Highland Park papers. A hundred people showed up. Oh and this was my in, goodness! This was in January of 1974, <gasps> and it was a wet day. And we, I mean, I, I can't believe that I did this, but we oh. walked um, two miles up to Gold Mesa in the Arroyo Seco. We found loads of plants. We cooked a meal. There was a dowsing demonstration. Mm -hmm. By the time I got everybody back at like, uh, you know, by, by the time it was dark, I think there were nine of us left. <laughs> but, but, but so that started it, and then we began to do more. And then, you know, then I, I, I took college courses. I took botany in college. I had a, I, my, my main uh, teacher probably in the mid-'70s was Dr. Leonid Inari. He was the, the botanist from Estonia. Mm. who was at the L.A. County Arboretum. And, and here's a guy, he had a Ph.D., he had a couple, I guess he had two Ph.D.s, but he had one in chemistry and one in botany, mm. although it wasn't called botany in Estonia, it was called, but the equivalent of botany. He lived during uh, Hitler's uh, invasion of Europe, he was in his early 20s, and he saw people die in the camps. In Estonia, it was light security, and after the, um, the war, he was in charge of uh, education in one of the displaced persons camps, and he used to say at his classes that he he got into this chemistry and botany because he wanted to be uh, a significant force so people don't have to starve. There's so much food everywhere in the world. Yes. And wow. th I must say that there was never a time that I took him a plant that he didn't know what it was in a few stories. So he was very instrumental <laughs> in, in my uh, uh, appendix, Edible Families, in the rear of my Guide to Wild Food book. He helped me with the book. He edited it. Mm -hmm. or he didn't really edit it, but he looked for uh, errors, Latin errors, the, the plant names, mm -hmm. helped clarify a lot. But he was he was one of my constant sources. So I would say pretty steadily since 1974, many times a year I would do classes, not necessarily every week like I do now. And, uh, you know, I was active in the L.A. Mushroom Society. And eventually I got to know some of the local Indians, like mm -hmm. the, the Gabrielinos or Tongo I knew. Dorothy Poole, she was a, a big influence. She was uh, mm -hmm. called Chaparral Granny. And mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, after my first book came out, uh, they would have me talk on the American Indian Hour, which doesn't exist mm -hmm. anymore, but it was on Pasadena City College, wow. about the native uses of plants. So this is we're talking wow. in the 70s. And one Saturday morning, I turned on the radio. I'm listening to American Indian Hour, Pasadena City College. It was uh, early in the morning on Saturday. And they were, and Dorothy was Dorothy Poole, Chaparral Granny was re, was was talking about a plant. 
that the mm-hmm. Indian juice. And I said, that, that sounds very familiar, what she's saying. So I grabbed my book, and I, she was just reading out of my book. Oh, so, to, wow. So, so to me, that was the greatest praise. Oh, wow. That, that, the, that the local Indian people found my book oh. worth, worthy of uh, using as a reference source. Amazing. And, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then gradually, just because of interest, I got, in, I got you know, into the other skills, how to make fire, how to make shelters, mm-hmm. all the tool-making wow. stuff that I do, weaponry capturing animals and, and of course the indian way of life always uh, the the spiritual side always interested me uh i i uh i used to do sweats long ago i think i did my first authentic sweat uh it was in ohio in probably 1997 or so where it was done properly i've been to many sweats over the years that's kind of an integral aspect of uh well of the of of the religious practices and and the, certainly in the Dakota area, among the Sioux, the the sweats precede every kind of a ceremony, and uh, you know the whole belief system. We have something that we call the old ways, where there's respect for family, where there's respect for nature, mm. uh, and and, and um, I've, I've I've given lectures on just that. I think I don't I, I think why am I even talking about this? Shouldn't this be in, ingrained into students? But it's not. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I do have, uh, I've given lectures on what we call the old ways traditions, the way of life. And uh, I, I probably will publish that eventually because I think it's something that we need to remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a way of life that, that's, that's beyond the plants. It's beyond the costumes. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's something about the way of thinking the way of interacting with other people, yeah. the way of interacting with resources, and that's what I think everybody's trying to get back to. That's what I think Chris Morasky at Elements is trying to get people to see. What is this old way of looking at people, realizing there's a spirit element, there's a mm. karmaic aspect to everything, yeah. and, and it's, it's, you know, it's piece by piece by piece for most people. But it's what I've done little by little my whole life with various teachers. I've, I mean, I've had a few key teachers, and of course, you could have the best teacher in the world, but you still have to apply these things so you gain personal lessons. Without yeah. a personal insight, a personal lesson, it's just a lot of intellectual stuff, mm. right? And, and so it's important to find the time to apply it in your life and, uh, and bring it alive. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I think all of this is about, bringing yeah. the old things alive, yes. I don't know if Nyan mentioned to you about the Sky People intentional community that we are creating. Uh, tell me. Oh, yeah, we are creating that um, in Los Angeles. So the idea is we really want to live 24-7 in an environment that is like a village, tuning uh-huh. in with one another, tuning in with the air. So it would be like a Bacay or a elements gathering, but always. So right, we are right. looking into building that because we really feel that we need an environment where we can connect with one another and live in nature. And, um, you know, since you mentioned about all of this, this way of living and, and how, how we can uh, connect with that, so do you feel that in the future this is going to be something that we embrace fully? I, I think that, um, believe it or not, if you properly define what this intentional community, I think... I think everybody in the world would find that that is their ultimate goal because you're almost defining uh, uh, an Eden uh, paradise type existence on Earth because mm, it's yes. because because if if we're if we're not focused and, and, and if you're going to have a lot of obstacles uh, you you know that I'm, I'm sure mm. but <laughs> but 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 you're, you know if everybody wants to get back to living a life that's meaningful yes everybody would like to yes. be a part of their production and not just be a consumer. Mm-hmm. I think I mean I think everybody wants to have something that's meaningful. They respect and they are respected. They're not they're not harming the environment. Who doesn't want to? And if somebody doesn't want to, there I would say there's something wrong with their thinking. Mm. But 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 I think it's it's almost a universal. It's like it's like I want to be a beachcomber and live on this beach and just <laughs> live off the land, but do it in a community. Yeah. So I don't I don't I don't know that anybody doesn't <laughs> want to do that. It's just that we have. Uh, and, and, and by the way, it probably does work and has worked in smaller communities. When you get too big, that's where you have a lot of problems. Mm. But, but a lot of the monasteries were probably self-sufficient right. entities of that sort. And uh, various I'm, I'm sure there have been various successful communities of that sort around the world throughout the years. And probably the breakaway societies like the Ammonites and the Amish 
we're, we're like that. And they're, they're, why are they self-sustaining? Because they have farms. Because they grow stuff, they make stuff, and, they, and, and money isn't their, their god. Now, mm. I don't know what the religious beliefs are of the Amish, but I certainly admire, uh, you know, their uh, refusal to use modern, many modern devices like cars and electricity. Mm. They, 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 don't, they don't entirely uh, eliminate uh, all modern things, but, it, you know, it has to be something very basic and, uh, that allows them not to be influenced by outside uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. And they also have a day of worship. They devote a whole day, typically on Sundays, for their church services. Oh. So whatever the church service or the spiritual focus is, that there ought to be one. I think when oh, you've yes. lost the spiritual aspect, whatever mm -hmm. it may be for you, mm -hmm. you've, you, you, you're missing the point. Because that, that has to be there, but so does everything else. You need, you need that element or else it's empty, right? Right. No, absolutely. And that is one of the foundations of, of our intentional community, that uh, sense of oneness, of connecting with the spirits of the land, the spirits of the plant people, animal people, stone people, really creating that, those relationships very strongly so that we can count on one another. And actually, in our intentional community, we are going to be a little balanced with technology because uh, both Nyan and I are quite uh, technology oriented and we feel that uh -huh. as long as we have a balance, we feel it's okay. <laughs> sure, sure. So well, I mean, I, I think there's nothing wrong with technology. Just let it serve us, don't serve it. You know, right, that's the right. Thank you. Yes, that's important yeah. too. And I think, you... I think... Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was wondering if you had any experience of living in an intentional community. Uh, not really. No, I've... I've uh... I've had a few interesting experiences, uh, but I mean, I lived on a. I'd have, no, I'd have to say honestly, no. I, I lived on my farm with my brother, my oh, uncle, and nice. and, nice. and that we were about we were pretty remote, you know. Yeah. The next house, the next house was the next farmhouse was a half a mile away. The town was three mm -hmm. miles. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I did that. I've lived in the woods for a while, but that's hardly an intentional community. That's, that's hiding awesome out in the woods. Too. Anything that yeah, yeah. you can share about that, that's very, very interesting to me, and I think for the people listening. Well, I think, I think when I would go to the woods by myself, it was, it, it, to some degree, it was more of a test, hmm. uh, but I, I don't think that I would ever want to live that way, because hmm. I, was, I did go just by myself. Hmm. I learned that, uh, to, that I could like, monitor my own thinking. Because I would just wonder, you know, what is what is all this about? You know, I, it, I think I think people should continue to do uh, a retreat, even a solitary retreat, where you think about your purpose in life and how you're mm -hmm. doing it. Yeah. But uh, but but uh, probably the closest that I lived in a, what you're describing would it would be when I was a squatter for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, and this was like in a large property of over an acre in a hilly area. And we, I had two other friends, acquaintances, you could say, who lived there with me. And we, uh, I mean, I, it, was, it was in probate court, and I broke in, and I had the utilities turned on in my name, and I told everybody what I was doing, all the neighbors. Wow. And they said, nobody challenged me, although a councilman came out, and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm the caretaker. Oh, and he wow. said, okay. And I said, I'll leave when the, when, the, when the proper owner shows up. And that was a year and a half later. Oh. But the three of us who lived there, we grew much of our own food. Hmm. We, uh, uh, we 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 tried to live ecologically. Hmm. Uh, we we cycled a lot. We had a wood stove where we did some of the cooking. Hmm. Uh, we for a while we even had a toilet that we used. It was like an earthquake experiment that was just a oh. porta potty that oh. had to be emptied in the yard. Oh. And 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 the thing that even though there were just three of us, we we made a point that every Sunday night because we all watched 60 Minutes. So every Sunday night we were home, mm -hmm. we would have a meeting, maybe a short meeting, to make sure everything, because it wasn't a family. We were all like three acquaintances. Yeah. So, But we, we, we realized the importance of a meeting to discuss and resolve things. Mm. So we did that, and we had certain protocol for our meetings, too, even though there were just three of us. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, so I think that uh, for a community to succeed, that's mandatory. Yeah. You, 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 you have to have a time when everybody time or times and everybody gets together and uh, discusses what's going on, mm -hmm. schedules things, decides yeah. on things, resolves problems, other things that are not working well. And, you know, the bigger society has all that. 
you, there, there is there, the, who resolves things? The police and the courts, oh. right? I mean, <laughs> who, who takes care of problems? The fire department and the police. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you're in an intentional community, you're trying to do all of that thinking and doing yourself, right? Uh, right. And without without being without pretending. So one of the things that I think is very important when people get together this way is to do whatever it takes to look at the situation you're in realistically. Hmm. Uh, if there's a real problem, uh, like there was, a, for example, there was a guy, one of the guys, this is something else I was in, but there was a guy who liked this girl who was there, but she, she was about to be tossed out because she was not pulling her own weight. Oh, and it was a work situation. He he said, "Well, I can do extra work for oh, her," but it wasn't. It really wasn't that kind of a thing that would lend itself to that. So he was pretending that she was equal, but she wasn't, right. and uh, that he could do more, but he couldn't. Mm -hmm. So I often encourage people to be honest with yourself and be realistic. And sometimes we write we write things down. If you write the problem down, is the problem the other person, or is the problem? This aspect of their behavior. In other words, just the more the more you can do this in a non-challenging and threatening way, the more people can communicate and come around to you know come around to what you're seeing. Mm. Uh, it, it's amazing because that is that is going to. I think I think that anybody who's half bright, they can create a community and they understand that we can recycle most of our stuff. We can start to make a lot of our stuff. We can grow most of our food. In, 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 not, in a relatively short time, I think, it's, uh, well, to be honest with you, I can't believe that more people don't do it today. The only reason they don't is because we, have, we can get cheap labor overseas and get most of the, you know, get a luxurious life based on somebody else's labor. Mm. And because, because money is still driving so many things. But for those, I think, who are enlightened, who want to pursue uh, a more enlightening lifestyle, it, ultimately, if you're living with the group, you have to find ways to resolve the problems. If, if you're on a board of an organization, you do this already. If mm -hmm. you, have, you go to some kind of meetings where they follow Robert's Rules of Order and you're trying to resolve problems, you're probably already on the right track mm -hmm. learning how to do this. The problem that I've found in many business-type things is that they, uh, they say, well, you, you have 30 minutes to voice your problem. I mean, 30 oh. seconds. Or a couple yeah. of minutes to face your problem. Right. In, the, in, the, in the real world, that's not going to cut it. Mm. You have to. You, I used to have meetings that would sometimes last hours because we were wow. we were trying to really identify the thinking. And, and if you're not on board, you're not on board. You're going to leave. You're not going to. This is all voluntary, you know. Obviously, mm. Uh, mm. but what is the thinking that leads to a certain problem, and how can we monitor and alter that, assuming we all have the same goal, which is X, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there's there's challenges out there, but I do believe that uh, it's that type of a goal is is something that everybody shares. Yes. How can I live, how can I live together yeah. with other people and and have my life be have my life mean something? Yes, and and really live in a in a way that we are free. We have to take certain responsibilities that we don't have at this moment. So it requires a transformation in ourselves, but it's so worth it. Because then we exactly. can really create. We can really create what we really want. Instead to complain about, oh, I don't like the system. This is not good. Blah blah blah. Or I don't have free time. Well, so let's create something new. It will take a little bit of adaptation and taking responsibility. But once we create new systems, I feel that we can really live thriving and in great joy and connecting with one another. And you know, I feel that our relationships that are so important sometimes we don't have them like in my case i'm i'm lucky that i don't have a nine to five job but there uh -huh. is so many people that every day is just getting up going to uh -huh. work working right, all day then go back home especially here in los angeles a lot of traffic so right. really it's no life nobody deserves that so i really well, want to encourage everyone <laughs> to, to be course. free it's to not, choice again it's not easy and uh this is why i tell people uh, look for the little changes because, you know, you, you, maybe you're right that if you could start something anew, but the reality is most people 
would uh, would would gladly make a little change in the right direction, mm. and then before they know it, oh, that's oh, that's actually <laughs> that I can actually grow some stuff in right. my backyard, and I could actually wow, I could make my own soil. Oh, right. you mean I could recycle? I mean, you little by little, <laughs> and then they realize. See, if you start to do that, then uh, uh, you you find success, and you have the courage to try more. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the problems that people uh, who don't even try these is they feel, well, everything is hypocritical anyway. You can't do it. You know, I'd have to say that my life is, there's a lot of hypocrisy in my life because uh, I can't do everything myself. I'm well aware mm-hmm. that I'm in a hypocritical world where I may, I don't support everything that uh, the supermarket does, mm-hmm. but I go there and I buy some things <laughs> and I try to buy carefully, right? I mean, if you think about all the businesses and people we interact with, you can't yeah. change everybody. You can only oh, change yeah. yourself. And right. so also, I, I make it a habit for myself, and, and I, I think it's a good habit, to not criticize other people in a, in a, in a griping, whining kind of way. I mean, maybe, right. uh, maybe a very specific, uh, constructive criticism where I'm offering what could be done better, other, then, then it's out of the realm of strictly criticism. But I can't tell you how many people I hear are always just talking about how bad so and so is, how bad that is, and I say, well, you know something, I'm not interested. I don't mm, care. What right. are you going to do? You've yes. been complaining ever since I got in the room here. I've, all I've heard is your complaints. What are you going to do? And, 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 and so I say, well, you vote, of course. Oh no, I don't vote because voting doesn't matter. I said, well, then you're part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about uh, writing a letter to your congressman because you don't oh. like this? Well, they don't read those letters anyway. So then you're 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 just complaining to me, but not willing to even try something minor that right. might help. So, right. so I mean, I believe that, you know, we don't live in a static world. There's, there, we, can, we can influence other people, but I, I strongly believe we've got to do that change with ourselves first. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean we have to be perfect, but, but politicians and people in the public realm, they, they are paid by us generally, so it's okay to influence them to do the right thing. It's okay and it's proper to try to influence the, the, the leaders around us, whether they're in government or in private industry, to do the right thing because mm-hmm. they are affecting our lives, and sometimes ignorantly, sometimes not. I think there is a lot of positive uh, thought in the air to, to move the society in the right direction, but yeah. there is also a long way to go. I, I, I don't like to kid myself in thinking that we're, 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 re, we're paradise is around the corner. Mm-hmm. But uh, but uh, little by little by little, we get there in ourselves and we move the the evolution of the culture forward. I feel that right now at this moment, uh, I'm experiencing so many people that has changed their lives. Like in the last two years, yeah, I I saw so many people changing their lives. Many of them are uh, like some of my students that come for classes. Uh, have been able to start a totally new life that is more in tune with what they desire. So that's a, a very big thing that I have in my heart that I want to to give as many options to people so that they at least see other possibilities in their lives. And I yeah, feel that that's... you know maybe maybe it's not as fast as we would like, but I I I can see the change accelerating and becoming faster and faster. And I think that even if the whole of the world doesn't change right away many of us are already living in a different way and i have oh, such a faith in us <laughs> that we're going to start really thriving and living in, a, in harmony with one another with the earth and you know the the government i appreciate i know that they we chose to have that there and little by little i feel that we have to to bring more of our authority to ourselves um, I'm not sure how this will work, but I feel that little by little we have to regain that responsibility, that authority in our lives, creating these villages, these intentional communities. So I feel that things are going to change so much. And I don't know how much it's going to, to take, <laughs> but I know that we're taking the steps so that we, all of us, are free. The people that is like you and I, the people that is working nine to five, and even the people that is in the government, maybe they could have even a, a more fulfilling life. Uh-huh. Now, I, I don't want to automatically um, suggest that uh, one is not fulfilled with a nine to five life, because I've done that before, and, and sometimes it was very useful, and mm-hmm. that, 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 that uh, structure 
was what was what I needed, and and sometimes I did feel very fulfilled. And mm-hmm. if I don't have it, sometimes I do. So so that might work for people, but because we have work is going to be involved. But I do I do think that people uh, should uh, be uh, uh, should be open to change where they can make the change. I'm I'm a strong believer of nonviolent change in society, yeah, yeah, and a strong believer of beginning with yourself. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and, 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 you know, government, we, we, we touched on money. We can't avoid money. With government, we can't avoid either. But what a lot of people that I've talked with about how they view government, uh, I think sometimes they get the wrong idea. There's a lot of folks that are very suspicious. It's them against us. And I said, well, as long as you hold that view, you're probably going to have the not make the best choices because mm-hmm. at least in your thinking, and, and I think in theory and in reality, the government is us. Oh, yes. So these are just yeah. these are just the guys that choose to do that full time that we pay, mm-hmm. yeah. and we are paying them. Mm-hmm. And if they don't do, if 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 they if if your employee, which is what all politicians are, they're your employee and my employee. <laughs> if they don't do what we feel is right, uh, then we need to fire them or get other people, and we certainly need to expose what they're doing incorrectly. And sometimes it's a judgment call. You know, you can't you can't know for sure unless you're in their shoes. But a lot of these guys, I hate to say it, they're crooks. They get into office, all they do is pad their own bank accounts, and they uh, get their girlfriend's uh, tax write-offs and all this stuff. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it seems like it's been a generation or two before or since people have gone into public office to serve the public good. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it, it's a risk, but it, it seems like, unfortunately, we're attracting the wrong kind of people, and we do want the best sort of people. I mean, you want to give them a break. But they are our employees. Mm. We're not, they're, they're not our bosses. We're not anointing kings in the United <laughs> States of America. They are our employees, including Obama, President Obama, including the governor, the, you know, the senators, everybody. Mm. And so to, to live in ignorance of what they're doing is foolhardy. Mm. Uh, I, I know in some countries you have no choice. So, oh you know, whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, the karmic consequences of being born in that country, mm-hmm. the evolution of that country, you have no choice unless you want to fight a, a revolution. But in our country, you know, that's still the presumption. And if you, if you cho- choose to abdicate your, your rights to vote or to write to them or to speak up at a public hearing, then you have become your own enemy. You, you, you're right. You, you, the, you, why complain? People who mm-hmm. complain about the big picture to me, who won't even vote, I tell them I'm not interested in your opinion. I am not interested because you didn't even bother to go in one day and make an informed decision on things that are affecting your day-to-day life. All these propositions we vote for, more important than the people often. You know, of course, the people are important too because they're the implementers of the laws and the things. But, but that's. That's our community, our big community. Uh, it's even harder if you're an intentional community and you have to be tactful face-to-face. You have to do that in an intentional community one way or another. But in, uh, in, in our society, we feel we have the option, and I feel that it's, it's, you shouldn't regard it as an option. You should regard it as a sacred duty to, mm-hmm. to get the right people in there to speak up if they don't do the right thing. Um, otherwise, well, otherwise, we've lost it all, Right. Um, uh, I have a question for you. Did you yeah. are you familiar with the citizen hearing on disclosure? Uh, say it again. The citizen hearing on disclosure. Are you familiar with that? No, unfortunately, I'm not. I will send I you a put... website. So okay. Okay, my... I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, um, you know, I've been researching so much lately about things like that. You know, our situation. Um, in many different aspects. So I will just send you the, this information because some of the things you're sharing, I, I, I would say I was with you, <laughs> but little by little, I, I just feel that the more that we can do is to start our communities. That's what I feel the most. Um, you it's know, certainly, it's certainly a good step to do that. I would, I would have yeah. to agree with you. You know, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, certainly a good step because it means that. You and like-minded people are trying to think for yourselves. That's good. Yes, it, it can only be a positive thing for the society. Yes, I, that's what I feel. Um, you know, and this is a big theme. I don't want to get too much into it because we're at the end mm-hmm. of our interview. Uh, okay. But this is this is a big theme. So I will just send you the link to that information and see. You know, maybe you resonate with it, maybe not. But I feel. I, 
that there is a, yeah. a wide range of information that I like to listen to, and this is one of the things that I appreciate, so I would like to share. Very good. <laughs> I'll look, I'm going to look forward to reading that. Awesome. And, you know, uh, last night I was talking with Nyan and asking him, hmm, what should I ask to Christopher? And, and he was telling me, well, he has done so many different things. Uh, he's open to metaphysics and sending healing and maybe things like rain dance that he had an experience with that. So you can ask him anything because he always will have something to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. So I like yeah. that. And so I have we, a we didn't even talk about rain dances or any of that stuff yet. Oh my goodness, I know. We need <laughs> another show. We need another show. Yeah, yeah. So that is one thing that, that, you know, this show is Earth Sky People Radio. Living in uh -huh. harmony with Mother Earth and awakening to an intergalactic society. So meaning that I believe that there are other beings that are not terrestrials and I would like to expand to that awareness and connect with those beings and, and not be limited to our an earthly society, but being an intergalactic society. So I would like to know what is your perspective on this, of anything extraterrestrial, extradimensional, um, do you believe in extraterrestrial life? Did you have any experience? Um, what is your perspective on all of that? Well, I think that well, I believe in reincarnation. I, mm -hmm. So, and I believe that in between, you know, like it, 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 I believe in karma and reincarnation. But even though we forget about our past lives, right. that that we're we're born into the society at the time and the place that's appropriate for whatever we've earned. But so where are we in the meantime? And, I, and it's possible that the souls are on other planets. It's also entirely possible that there are inhabited planets. I mean, I think mm -hmm. Carl Sagan even, uh, he wrote the movie Contact, and he believed that there are other uh, uh, intelligent life forms evolving in a different way elsewhere. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he said, you know, we have billions and billions of galaxies. How could it not be that there's something else going on? Oh. I, I, I've had a few... Uh, a few UFO things, but it would be hardly considered extraterrestrial because they might, although they might have explanations, they were very strange. <laughs> uh, I mean, it could have been something from the Earth. But, would uh, you share but, one of those? Well, okay, I have two stories I want to share. One <laughs> is, um, uh, and this is not, doesn't really tell you anything about extraterrestrial life necessarily, but I, I used to go down to Big Bang, Texas with my brother, we went. We would go there when we had uh, time because it takes two or three days to drive there, and uh, we we liked. I mean, I wrote articles for some outdoor magazines about the park, Big Bend Park. It's right on the Rio Grande River. We would go into the hot tubs down there. We would study the unique plants, and we always had a good time going down there. So coming back one time, you you know you're going through Texas and whatever those states are, and uh, you, you know you're driving forever, and the landscape is is identical. Mm -hmm. And at one, you know, you, you see my, you could see ten miles away, just cactus, telephone poles, mm -hmm. you know, the same old thing over and over and over. Just, you just, you could fall asleep for a couple hours, wake up, and you would you know, the exact same thing. So at one point, there was we we were driving in a large flat area, in this little dip, and and we both sort of noticed in the rearview mirror that a car. There was, and there were no cars by the way. We hadn't seen cars for an hour or so. This is down mm -hmm. way down in Texas, uh, on some little side road. And then we noticed a, a red headlights approaching us very fast. Mm. And we're talking like, I mean, well, all we saw was the headlights. It was so remarkable. I just said, do you see that? Mm. And we, we said, yeah, we weren't drinking. We weren't high, nothing like that. We pulled over to the side of the road. The car is approaching at this rapid speed. It goes into a little dip, and then, it dis and then nothing happens. We, see, we looked at each other. Did you see that? Oh. Yeah. And, and so... So we turned around. We, we, we couldn't let that go. It, it was something that we both saw, red lights approaching very fast. Wow. We went down to the dip. We stayed at the dip for about 20 minutes. There was, oh. no, there was nothing there. Wow. There were no tracks. There were no tunnels. There were no holes. There was no way that if there was an object approaching that it could have disappeared. It made no sense. Mm -hmm. So that was my, one of my so-called UFOs. Whatever it was, I have no mm -hmm. idea, but it was outside of Marfa, Texas, and years later, I'd hear about the lights of Marfa oh, that wow. people would go watch. Oh, wow. so, what, 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 whatever the phenomenon at Marfa was, this was real close to Marfa. Uh, I mean, in Marfa, by the way, you could sneeze and look the other way, and you've missed Marfa. 
it's a small, it's a small little town. <laughs> about that. You could, you could, you could, you could reach down to pick up something. You drop it on the floor and you pass through Marfa. But so it's spread out. I mean, there's a community there, but there's a little store or something you pass in a hurry. But my other story, uh, when I, uh, Helen and I, my wife Helen and I, we used to go down. We still go down to uh, study with the with the Mayan priest uh, Miguel Angel Vergara in uh, in the Yucatan area. And one of the things he teaches us is he teaches well. There's different things really about the spiritual beliefs and practices. But one was one in particular. This this was a year I was down there. And I got a phone call. Well, actually, we were in Guatemala at the time. Okay, so it was Guatemala, not not Mexico. And I got a phone call while I was down there that week that my next oldest brother had died. So I was Mm -hmm. kind of bummed out thinking about my brother. He just dropped dead, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we were doing these meditations then, the day later. And one of them was we were studying the symbols, the meaning of the symbols, the esoteric meaning of the Mayan glyphs. Hmm. And 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 one of them. And by the way, I don't have it in front of me, but I have a book called "Till Death Do Us Part." Yeah. People could look at it on Kindle. "Till Death Do Us Part." It's lessons about death, dealing with funerals and things. And if any of your listeners wanted, I could send them just that chapter that I'm talking about. It's an appendix called uh, uh, I don't know something about studying with the Mayans. Hmm. But but our teacher Miguel Angel was. was telling us to close our eyes, and he had some music in the background. He said to go into this glyph. The glyph is like a circle. There's a diagonal line through it, and there's three little round things on it. I forgot what the name of that, <laughs> that Sorry, I apologize. Mm-hmm. But I forgot the name of that particular glyph. And so uh, I was very successfully able to go into the glyph, and that round glyph was like a spaceship. Oh, wow. It was like a spaceship. <gasps> and, uh, and then I was on the middle knob inside, and mm-hmm. I flew through space. Wow. And I went outside of our galaxy, oh. and this is all in the course of a few times. I'm sitting in the room, my eyes are closed, mm. but I'm, I'm able to spiritually feel myself wow. out, out in space. Mm. And then out in space, my, my mother was there. She had mm. passed away several years early, and my brother Richard, who just died, and they said mm. to come to them to the outer edge of the galaxy through that glyph, mm. and there's other things that they can share with me. Mm. And mm. I knew it would take a long time. But I knew that there are places, physical places, where inanimate and animate objects and people reside. Mm. Uh, I did go back later to another time, which becomes a whole different lesson. But through that exercise, I mean, the, the, you know, people have to use some mechanism or some vehicle for understanding other life if it's in another planet. And, and it, it gave me some brief understanding that you have access to other information meant mm-hmm. through your own mind, through the discipline and training of your own mind. Mm-hmm. And so um, later, uh, uh, I was sharing with everybody that I, I came back to Earth, okay, I'm still in the meditation, I came back to Earth, and I asked my brother, you know, uh, I told him I was feeling sorry that he had died. And this is mm-hmm. like, back to Earth, from the glyph, and then we all gathered on this mountaintop, in with my, you know, it's in in the dream, in the in the vision, in the in the little insight, and my brother said, uh, "No, I don't. I don't want you to be sorry for me. I want you to be happy." Mm-hmm. Okay, and then we started mm-hmm. uh, talking back and forth, and singing a song, mm-hmm. and then everybody, all the dead people that I know that I loved were present, and then all my fr- and friends and close family, and it was like a big circle, and we were all singing how everybody is one, mm-hmm. and we're all part of the same uh, body, the same. Wow. You know, if, if we're all part of God, we're all yeah. we are we all are the same, and we were feeling that and realizing it, which you don't in daily life when you're fighting and struggling and everything. Yeah. And 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 so we were singing, and it was, like, and I know this sounds funny, but it was it was almost like we were singing Michael Jackson's "We Are the World." Oh, uh, okay? wow! It, 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 was, it was almost like that, and and uh, and eventually. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and the reason I came back to Earth was because I knew that the guy Miguel Angel would ring the bell and the meditation time would be over. Oh. But it was it was beautiful, and I shared that at my brother's funeral a week mm. later. And a lot of people just kind of rolled their eyes. Oh. They didn't realize how real that was. That yeah, was a that, you know they, they you know you could say well that's just in Christopher's mind, but uh, so this is why all realizations are personal. 
you but are you were crazy. there for me i'm totally sure you were there we yeah, we just live very... we live limited to the five physical sensors in, inside a box but when we are able to go beyond that of course you can go where you went so i totally exactly. believe it was true so so the, the meditation was my mechanism to go beyond the senses and to go yeah. to another realm yeah. And uh, it wasn't. It's not exactly a UFO story, but it's the closest I've got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow! Thank you so much for sharing that. How beautiful! Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And thank you for all your sharing today. We're going to start closing up the show. It has okay. been so beautiful to be with you. And for those oh, I had a, who... I had a good time. I really oh. enjoyed it. Awesome. And for those who would like to check out your books and your classes, your website is ChristopherNiargas.com. Is that correct? That's correct. It's it's my name, Christopher N Y E R G E S, and I and a friend of mine said the way you remember my spelling is uh, the last name. If you can remember, not your everyday regular guy eating salad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but you can also go to you can also go to schoolofselfreliance dot com, but okay. it's schoolofself hyphen reliance dot com, hmm. and and they'll they'll find me. And uh, if they, people have questions about the story I just told, they, they can just the email is there to contact us. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much for this very inspiring and very practical interview. <laughs> thank you very much. I really had a good time. Mm, beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to just share that next week we will have Dwayne Hartman. And all the details about this outstanding show will be at victoriavives.com forward slash radio. And I'm going to just play some announcements by Karen Newman about all the shows in the Enlightenment Evolution Network. Okay, so have a good week. Bye. Hi, this is Karen Newman from the show About Oneness, and here's what's coming up on the Enlightenment Evolution Network 1 and 2 for the week starting on Monday, September 8th until Sunday, September 14th. Simply put, Rob Gothier, founder of the EEN and the host of the show that started it all, the Enlightenment Evolution Hour, has put together the greatest metaphysical radio network ever. Seven days a week, we have shows that will aid you on your path to enlightenment, evolution, and ascension on the Enlightenment Evolution Network 1 and the Enlightenment Evolution Network 2. On EEN 1, Mondays, starting at 6.30 p.m., PST and 9.30 p.m. EST is Heart to Heart Talk Radio with your host, Daniel Scranton. Join Daniel and his featured guests discussing a wide variety of metaphysical topics. Daniel channels the Creators, the Hathors, Ophelia the Fairy, and the Archangel Michael, and now the latest, the Unicorn Collective. Daniel and his guests will take phone calls and questions, and it's sure to generate high-frequency discussions. You can find out more about Daniel at his website, danielscranton.com, and also on Facebook. Facebook. Go to the events tab on Daniel's website to learn more about Daniel's upcoming events. Daniel's guest on Monday is Marilyn Holzman. On Tuesday at noon Pacific Standard Time and 3 p.m. Eastern, please join hosts Megan Crandelmeyer and Rachel Archelaus for Radio Inspiration, Expression, and Abundance for their show, Soulfulpreneur. Spiritual business specialists Rachel and Megan will bring you inspiring conversations with people who are living their soul purpose. Frequent guests include psychic mediums, channelers, coaches, artists, and authors. They end every show with psychic readings and business coaching. Your questions about spiritual business or life purpose journey are welcome. This week, Rachel and Megan will discuss the book Breaking Loose from the Money Game. On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific, is the show that started it all, the Enlightenment Evolution Hour, with host Rob Gottier. Rob channels Treb on the first Wednesday of each month and will take callers' questions. And on the third Wednesday, we'll have a special guest such as guest channelers and other metaphysical teachers. The other two Wednesdays are freestyle call-in shows to discuss whatever callers have on their minds. Tune in to Rob on Wednesday nights, and you can also find him at Treb channel channeling.com and on Facebook at the Enlightenment Evolution Network group page. Rob has two special announcements. Introducing what is shaping up to be the event of the year for Treb Channeling. We are excited to have some of the greatest channelers in the world. On Saturday, September 13th, beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Channel Panel. This is a live interactive online event. The event will be easily accessible to anyone with internet on their device, phone, Mac or PC. 
The event is six hours and it has the greatest names in channeling today, including Brad Johnson, John Cali, Nora Harold, Rob Gautier, and Daniel Scranton. The moderator is co-host Kalina Angel. The cost for this great event is $45. If you go to tropechanneling.com, you can register and find out all about the details. Another project near and dear to Rob's heart is the much-anticipated sequel to the groundbreaking film Tuning In, called Tuning In Now. The movie will feature channelers such as Daryl Anka and Bashar, Lee Carroll and Cryon, and our very own Rob Gautier and Treb. Tuning in now will explore the amazing work of today's top channels and how they are helping to awaken the consciousness of the planet. The film is in fundraising stages at the moment, and with a contribution of as little as $15 all the way up to $50,000, you can help make sure this film is made. Please go to Indiegogo.com. That's www.indiegogo.com and type in the search Tuning In Now 2. All details about donations to this film can be found on the indiegogo.com website. Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific, join host Philip Malika with the Consciousness Evolution Hour. Join Philip and his special guests and co-hosts as they discuss the shift, ascension, timelines, metaphysical concepts, and the fifth dimension. Find Philip on the Consciousness Evolution 2.0 group page on Facebook and on YouTube. On Friday, The Earth Experience with host Kalina Angel at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. The Earth Experience explores our soul's expansion through our human experiences on Earth. Kalina will help you navigate and expand through the exciting confusions that we are manifesting as new 5D beings. On Saturday, Odyssey of Ascension with your host, Roxanne Swainhart. Join the one and only Roxanne Swainhart for two hours of Knock Your Socks Off Ascension downloads. Be open, be ready, and just be with her while she answers your questions about ascension, extraterrestrials, soul purpose, energy activations, and all things ascension. Roxy is a channeler and ascension guide extraordinaire in these extraordinary times. Living in San Antonio, Roxy received an awakening experience and promptly exploded onto the metaphysical scene, posting videos, blogging, and doing live group channeling and changing the lives of all she encounters. Roxy channels the entities of Cepheus, the Hathor Guides, the Sasani Guides, and the Collective Oversoul Fire, just to name a few. Come join her for an unforgettable couple of hours on your personal path. On Sundays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 11 a.m. Pacific is my show About Oneness. About Oneness is a weekly radio program focused on celebrating the ongoing conscious awakening of our planet and a realization of oneness. I am an American originally from Charleston, South Carolina, now living in the Netherlands. I am an integrated channel, medium, Reiki master, and metaphysical teacher. I have a varied and diverse background, including that of being a singer, dancer, writer, as well as working in the sport nutrition and fitness world. As a channel, I bring forward the information of my non-physical guides called Theos, whose message is always that of oneness and unconditional love. The show for me is about integrating all of my experiences and following my highest excitement, which is tapping into truth so I can better understand my place in the universe. Like to learn more about me, my upcoming guests, as well as see videos of channelings and teachings, you can visit aboutoneness.com. On Sunday, September September the 14th, my guest will be the amazing James E. Charles. And then on the Enlightenment Evolution Network 2, on Tuesdays, join host Victoria Vives at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific, for your host of Earth Sky People Radio, your bridge between heaven and earth. Subjects will include planet Earth, becoming part of an intergalactic society, star seeds and extraterrestrial life, living in oneness with one another, with Mother Earth, and with life beyond Earth. The Interstellar Alliance, also known as the Galactic Federation of Light, music, frequency, and sound healing, question and answer interviews, shamanism, ancestral wisdom, and the star nations, self-sustainable and regenerative living, and much, much more. 
Coming this Tuesday, join Victoria and her guest, Christopher Nyergis, for a sharp and thought-provoking interview. This week is Earth Time on Victoria's show, and this is an adventure episode with the author of over a dozen wild foods, ecology, and self-reliance books and DVDs. See all the details at victoriavivez.com forward slash radio. And you may think that that is all, but there are several new shows coming on on the EEN2, including a show by the Pied Piper, as well as in just a few weeks, starting on 21 September, is The Resonance Intention, hosted by Soul and Neil Gar. The Resonance Intention show is dedicated to all things frequency and vibration. They will showcase conscious musicians who infuse frequency into their music and have set up to uplift and raise the vibration of humanity through their music. They will have in-depth conversations with various artists about their passion, purpose, and personal journey that led them to where they are now. Additionally, they will routinely have guests on the topics of free energy technology and other quantum modalities technologies that are coming into existence. The Resonance Intention is a platform for artists, musicians, and inventors to increase awareness about their personal approach in order to contribute to the paradigm shift that we are currently within. And you never have to miss a show at the Enlightenment Evolution Network 1 or 2. All shows are available to listen to again immediately after they air on playback. All right, back to the show. Hi, this is Victoria Vives, host of Earth Sky People Radio, living in harmony with Mother Earth and awakening to an intergalactic society. You can tune in with me every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, which is 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and check all the information about this radio show at victoriavives.com forward slash radio. That is Victoria, B-I-V-E-S, dot com forward slash radio. And this is the Enlightenment Evolution Network 2. So this is a different phone number and everything. 347-215-8586. And you can call in for questions or just for listening. Remember, every Tuesday, 6 p.m. Pacific Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Victoria Vives with the Earth Sky People Radio. Looking forward to connecting with you. Bye! We're still growing up Thinking that we are separated But we are one We're still growing up that we stand on our own That we are one Loneliness Thinking that we cannot connect But we are one Soon I felt your love from within Soon I heard your voice calling me Saying that I am so much more than that
Estão 